So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to chair this session this morning. Um, I'm Seychelle Voss. I'm a faculty member in the biology department um, at MIT. And our first speaker this morning is Dariusz Plavinsky from the University of Warsaw. Uh, and he will be telling us about the spatial chromatin architecture alteration by structural variations in human genomes. Hi, hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give uh, a short talk about our recent results, which are related with the fundamental question, which is namely how the spatial chromatin architecture is altered by the structural variation in, uh, in, the, uh, in the human genomes. So how the changes in sequence of DNA sequence of uh, in, um, which can be observed in a human population is translated into differences in the three-dimensional structure. So that's basically our, um, our idea uh, of our work and, uh, and the recent results. Um, I am co-affiliated at Warsaw University, which is a center of new technologies. And at the same time, I'm also co-affiliated co at the Warsaw University of Technology. And that's uh, some which, which, is, uh, which was interesting for us and it was somehow uh, founded on the on the fundament on the basis of the Ford Nuclear project, uh, which was initiated uh, by NIH. And, uh, but also, not only this project, but also ENCODE uh, start to, to provide three dimensional um, NGS based data uh, to the scientific community. Uh, and those um, consortia allows actually us to understand what is the variability of the 3D structure of chromatin across different cell types. Okay, so that's, that's important because um, then this knowledge can be extended based on the sequence information we have, which is collected for multiple individuals in the human, uh, in the human population, how these, uh, these structures would be affected by the sequence variability okay, within the human population. So the, the concept, uh, so our participation in Ford Nucleum was focused on, on a specific approach, which is chia -PET, and I will talk about it um, uh, shortly, and also about imaging studies, uh, which allows us to build the effective, very um, high throughput modeling platform, which allows to construct the 3D structures, uh, 3D models of uh, chromatin 10 nanometer fiber, and based on a, on a sequence information and a reference for the structure. Okay, but coming back to the, to the original question, so we have sequence, we have structure, and we have function. Okay? And uh, the problem of relation between sequence structure and function in the case of chromatin is definitely a multi-scale problem, and it reflects the complexity of uh, human genome. Yeah? So we start with double helix with the size 30 nanometer, then we have um, nucleosomes which uh, DNA is interweaved around and it provides so-called 10 nanometer uh, chromatin fiber and then the whole structure uh, of, the, uh, of the, in this case, human genome is being constructed. So, so we have very complex, uh, very long and very complex biomolecule uh, which we are trying to analyze. Um, and this multi-scale uh, organization is also reflected in the context of uh, functions. So we have certain regions uh, which are critical for specific genes or specific enhancers. So for example, chromatin looping allows you actually to see interactions between promoter enhancer regions. Uh, on the other hand, there are um, so-called topologically associated uh, neighborhoods in which uh, certain sets of genes or, or enhancers are working together um, in a more or less coherent way to provide a specific uh, biological function and so on. So there is a chromosomal territories, there is a, a A and B compartment, E heterochromatin, E chromatin. There is also an important biological role of nuclear lamina which uh, silence uh, some specific regions of DNA. Uh, in terms of modeling, actually, um, the, the, the problem is, is extremely complex. I and mean, if you start with modeling, like by quantum mechanics or by molecular dynamics, uh, 
single atoms, then it would be uh, very challenging in terms of pure raw computing powers to model something larger than the, the small actual fragments of the whole two meter long chromatin uh, which we observe in our human genome. Okay? So the, the micro scale it's, uh, itself, multi scale, and also macro scale, uh, again, is also of different uh, scales, fashion, or scales which can be observed uh, in, the, in the genome. Okay, so what are the two um, fundamental methods which allows actually to um, identify experimentally some structural information uh, about the chromatin? So the two general technologies are either based on a microscopy, in this case I'm showing 3D fish, in which you can observe like two different genome plotchy very precisely and uh, for example calculate the physical distance between them. So the physical distances would be R uh, here and S is the distance along the chromatin fiber. Okay? So you have to like go uh, through the whole fiber into the, uh, and calculate what's the distance between the, along the fiber. Uh, and then you can try to correlate for so some uh, observing multiple lochi pairs of lochi like that, what will be the relation between linear distance and uh, physical distance. In the case of uh, MGS-based methodologies, uh, what people observe is not only two, you know, pair, I mean, a single pair of two general lochi, but actually all against all. But what you're observing is not signs in the physical distance like in the microscopy, but rather a certain probability of, of a contact across different cells. So, so to get such a um, probability of contact map, which is, as I said, all against all regions in the, in the given uh, segment of DNA, or maybe it could be the whole chromosome or even the whole genome, um, and then, then you can observe which regions tends to interact to be close to each other uh, as compared to other regions which tend to be actually far away from each other. Okay, so what we learn up to now uh, from microscopy, first of all, this is the fundamental observation that chromosomes does not mix, uh, do not mix. Okay, so they, they, they occupy separate sub-volumes of the, of the nuclear uh, uh, space, and therefore, if you uh, use some oligo painting to um, uh, color a specific, uh, specific chromosome, uh, then those colors will not mix. So they, will, they will actually stay uh, differently. So that it means that actually uh, it's not a random polymer, it's actually a very well organized cellular machine, nuclear machinery. Moreover, if you go to higher resolution uh, using, uh, for example, uh, electron microscopy or some uh, super resolution light microscopy, you can observe that the, generally speaking, nuclear volume is divided into dense regions and uh, sparse regions. Okay, and the sparse regions has a lower density of chromatin, whereas the, the dense regions, um, uh, they, they are characterizing inactive region, uh, regions inactive nuclear compartment, heterochromatin, which is actually uh, uh, harbor uh, genes which are kind to of switch off. So, so you can approximate uh, the nuclear um, structure of the nuclear uh, volume with the swamp-like uh, landscape in which you have channels which allows you to uh, transport quickly some biomolecules, like the water channels here, and also some, some islands of dense uh, regions which should definitely slow down the, the interaction, slow down the transport and so on. Uh, going back to the genomic methods, two methods are actually uh, fundamental and if they were introduced in 2009, fundamental to understanding the all against all interactions uh, for, 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 for uh, in this case, human genome. So high C and chiapet. but in the case of high C, you get the signs in the heat map, which reflects the probability of interaction across different uh, all regions, all segments of DNA. Uh, with, here we have like chromosome 14, and of course it could be another chromosome or whole genome. 
the case of chiapet, there is additional step, uh, which is related with the immuno precipitation. So this step selects from all those interactions which are observed in high C, very specific interactions which are related with the protein mediator. In this case, that could be in our approach, actually we are using data mostly from two proteins, CTCF and RNA po 2 So those arcs, so therefore the, um, we don't use heat maps like here, but we use arcs and the, each arc represents a single interaction between beginning and end of the such so-called chromatic loop. And this beginning and end is glued with the given protein, so the CPCF in this, in this uh, example, or it could be a RNA protein. So there are similarities and differences between those methods. Uh, CHEP provides um, higher resolution without uh, deep sequencing, so this is cost effective. On the other hand, CHEP is uh, very challenging experimental technique, so it's not easier to perform such an experiment. I see it's much more easier to be done, uh, but you have to sequence deeply to actually start to observe the, the chromatin loops. Okay, so uh, the understanding of genome, which goes, uh, which is rooted in the, in the observations, either high C or chiapet, is that uh, we, we indeed observe two phases in the, in the genome, so dense and the sparse phase. So the dense would be heterochromatin, sparse would be chromatin. Uh, and they, uh, they, they tend to form separate uh, compartments. And those compartments therefore reflect uh, the, reflect the uh, differences uh, in the function performed by these, these regions which are either in heterochromatin or in euchromatin. But moreover, if you go to the higher resolution, you start to see genomic domains. So certain uh, globular structures along the chromatin fiber, uh, which form so-called paths or topologically associated uh, domains, which, uh, which allows actually to build like a local neighborhoods, which harbors genes or enhances. Uh, okay, so the multi-scale nature, multi-scale organization of chromatin is reflected here. We start with whole genome, then the whole chromosome compartments, domains, and finally chromatin loops. Um, and, uh, and it was already proved that uh, changes of the, at the level of sequence, like deletion, for example, of the border between those two topologically associated domains, uh, is leading to the, so the boundary deletion leads to the reconstruction of the three-dimensional changes in the comet. Okay, so you see here that single deletion over here actually leads to the fusion of two independent dots, that three and that two. Now we have only that, that single that two composed of uh, initial that one, uh, that two and three. So, so we see the changes in 3D structure, and those changes in 3D structure actually leads to the unexpected interactions between enhancers and, and, and promoters, therefore activation of genes which were supposed not to be activated. So indeed, uh, we, we, we can confirm, and this is done by uh, Lipanes uh, with colleagues, that such divisions can lead actually to a, a lot of functional changes. And this was done uh, by Lupanus with the division uh, of the boundaries of tiles, actually over here. But we also, in 2015, we, we performed analysis and we observed that even a single SNP can affect the chromatin loop, can affect the chromatin loop presence uh, by prohibiting binding of CTCF. Okay. Chromatin looping, uh, short recap because before we will go to the computational methods. Uh, two main sources of chromatin looping uh, data. Uh, first one is based on a high C, published in 2014, uh, and the chromatin loops are those uh, bright spots uh, in the heat maps. Uh, whereas the data which we are using mostly is based on the chiapet, so this is the interactions I was telling you CTCF or LMA2. And uh, what we observe is that CTCF seems to be, uh, those interactions seems to be. Uh, responsible for the chromatin architecture, whereas RNA-PO2 
interactions are more, more dynamic, um, they are forming for a shorter period of time and then reassembly, um, drawing genes and enhancers to our, towards so-called interaction centers. So, so it's like uh, condensation of the phases uh, in the system. Uh, actually, is here is one phase, namely the, the interaction center um, recruits multiple proteins and also multiple fragments of the DNA, chromatin loops by, by RNA code to chromatin looping, on top of the you know, predefined and uh, designed based mostly by the CPU, because of the sequence, CPCF chromatin looping. Okay, the modeling, uh, there are different approaches which, uh, which uh, can be applied. Either you can use polymer physics model, in, in which you, the model introduces uh, certain uh, constraints and then construct the food models, and then you can calculate the observables. Or you can perform data-driven modeling, when you use uh, directly the experimental data and then you construct the food models which are in agreement, and also the final um, uh, methodology, which uh, was introduced by Piquero uh, and colleagues, and uh, uh, one year later we also introduced this methodology based on epigenomic marks, you can actually predict the food structure okay, without using it. So it is somehow in between between the data driven, uh, where the data is actually through the context, and the polymer physics, where the uh, input is, is not experimental data. So our methodology is so-called food gnome. I will maybe not go too deeply into details. The input is actually the chipot experiments of so simplotons and pet clusters. Then we perform certain steps of denoising and um, preparation of the interaction data. Then we generate the food models. And then based uh, on the food models, we, we construct the ensembles of the data. So, so uh, we, we tested our approach for multiple cell types. Um, so, for example, for GM12878, we will have around 80,000 of the CTCF loops. And if you actually require a uh, cohesin peak to be present, then it's around 40,000 of chromatin loops, whereas um, RNA code two loops would be at the order of, of 70,000. Um, you know, such loops, and then you can, based on this experimental data, construct the 3D model, and the construction is, is founded by the polymer physics, so, and it's top-down approach, so you start first with the localization of chromosomes in the nuclear space, then each chromosome is being modeled, modeled as a, a chain of uh, parts, or CCDs, or uh, those interaction centers I mentioned earlier, and then each CCD or TAT or interaction center is being modeled precisely as a collection of chromatin loops using some, some polymer physics model. So from the input data, so CTCF uh, interactions and in RNA equal to, taking into account the orientation of CTCF motif, then we can construct the 3D structures for the interaction centers or TATs. Uh, this is one of the visualizations. Actually, what we are constructing at each spatial scale, we're constructing the ensembles of 3D structures, uh, and those ensembles of 3D structures uh, then can be analyzed in terms of building, for example, the heat map, which reflects the probability of interaction. You can test your modeling with the noise by performing noise analysis by adding noise based on the data. Um, and this methodology is actually presently available as a 3 dgnom 2.0 web server, which do additional things. So from sequence, it is able to predict the 3 d structure. And based on 3 d structure, you as a biologist, you can identify and understand better the biological function. Okay, so the web server is accessible uh, under this link, and the 3D architecture uh, of the, the whole service uh, provides actually uh, I needed computational resources to actually perform such multiple uh, jobs. Uh, okay, so I will I will um, uh, I will uh, stop in a moment. The, the last slide I would like to share with you is actually related with the uh, modeling engine, which allows in a very precise way. So here there is a tau region of the human genome. Uh, and a specific uh, set of interactions. Uh, um, 
uh, the slide which shows how we do the food modeling across the population. So based on the reference food structure and the chromatin looping which is identified by the experiments chiapet in this case the CF and RNA code to chiapets, each uh, structural variance of the change of the DNA sequence is being mapped onto the reference food structure and if for example by the deletion you remove the C uh, segments of so the uncle which are those two chromatin loops, then basically those chromatin loops vanish and you have a changes on the schema, uh, in this case, chromatic fluid model from the model which has all four chromatin loops to the model which has only two. Okay? And it's then modeled by polymer physics into the fluid structures, actually ensemble of those fluid structures. And similar for that duplications, inversions, insertions. Okay, so that's that's our idea. That's how it how it works. Um, so so uh, maybe I'll stop uh, here, and uh, I will uh, just put a summary. So with our in silico technology, we are able to model 3D structures across the whole human population. So as an input, we use only DNA sequence, but uh, in addition to the DNA sequence. We have to use um, reference free structures. In this case, it was GM2078, so it was lymphoblastic cells, B cells, and therefore the 3D models across the plant population will be uh, valid only for B cells. Okay, that would be not a 3D structures for, for neurons or some other types of cells. So I would like to thank uh, founding agencies, um, uh, Foundation for Polish Science. Uh, food by fellowship, also uh, working in an impact uh, project, uh, and many other sources. And uh, of course, I would like to thank also my uh, team, my laboratory, a lot of people uh, involved uh, in everyday work and also with the results. I would like to mention Michael Sadowski, who was the first author and actually um, very active across the whole project, and Chen uh, Shawai. Uh, Zofia Parteka, Mikhail Zminski, Mishko Kraft, Mikhail Vasnodowski, who was a uh, co-author of the Food Demand in 2.0, the main author of Trump, Michael Kavlov, uh, and our collaborators, uh, Jimmy Wang, Charles Lee, uh, collaborators from Poland, and also Tsegemo from uh, Zurich, uh, who helped us a lot with calibrating other NGS based food uh, uh, and computer methodology. To the, uh, using the high resolution uh, imaging data. Mm. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, this is our workplace uh, center of new technologies at the Warsaw University, and this is the Warsaw University of Technology, the Department of Mathematics and Information Science. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, and, uh, I'm open to answer any questions you have. Thanks. Thank you, um, Professor Flinsky, for your talk. Are there any questions um, in the audience? You can use the raise hand function um, in the participant section um, if you have a question. Don't see any yet. Um, I guess I will ask a question first, um, since no one seems to have one yet. Um, your, you said this was specific for B cells, your modeling. Um, what um, extent do you think um, you can modify this for other cell types? I guess you have to get the, the high C data and we know that it, the mapping will differ between cell types and also um, with different chromatin modifications. How do you think that will affect um, your, your mapping algorithms? We actually perform a specific analysis and uh, we are working actually uh, uh, in the last uh, couple of months on the, doing the um, Chiapet experiment across different individuals. So in that way, uh, on the same cell type, so in this case, B-cells. So we can actually compare the, the experimental data, three-dimensional experimental data across different individuals for the same cell line. And it seems that the, the, like the core of interactions are being present across individuals for the, the same cell type. And of course, uh, then the next step which we are currently working is to go across different cell types uh, with the um, first chiapet as a, our source for the modeling. So the source, the list of interactions, both CTC and RNA maple 2 And uh, we are currently working on uh, three, four, four uh, cell types uh, 
comparing them and uh, definitely we see a lot of differences between cell groups. Okay, so that's why we believe that, you know, uh, the ideal experiment would be to do the um, chiapet or high chip or plaque seek, I mean, any type of the uh, technology which gives you chromatin looping uh, for CTCF mainly and FO2 um, across uh, single individual multiple cell types. And then uh, with this technology I presented today, you could then sc uh, scale up the, the models for the different cell types across the population. Uh, we, we, uh, in in uh, our recent paper, we actually compared uh, um, uh, uh, high chips uh, for CTCF and RNA-NPO2 and it's across individuals. So they also seem to be uh, very highly correlated. Um, okay, so that's... Yeah, no, great. Thank you. Um, the next question, I think, is from Jose, if I'm not mistaken. I only see... That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, here's Jose Onushik. This was a very nice talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think uh, we all have been interested in modeling chromosomes and the full nucleus. I'm, I'm interested in the idea that uh, going from a single chromosome to the full nucleus. You said that you have this hierarchical approach, appears very interesting and very promising. But I always wonder, are we allowed to go hierarchical? Are these energies in the same level that bases hierarchy, although it's conventional in terms of computation, may not be true in reality, that the interactions between... So do you think really the interactions between chromosomes are, are weaker than the inter, inner, inter and intra that we are allowed to go hierarchical, or that's just a convenience? That's a very good question. So uh, to be honest, the triapet, but also other techniques, uh, are more tuned to see interactions within the chromosomes, although those interactions will be like um, visible more strongly. Uh, in our our approach was um, somehow trying to um, provide a certain solution for biologists in terms of the very rapid construction of 3D models. So it was um, it is done in the way that actually the modeling of the whole nucleus can be done within uh, seconds or minutes in the browser. So the, all the code is like embedded in the browser. Uh, so, so, so you can model uh, almost instantly the, the 3D structure. The only way to do it is to, you know, go from top to down, not other way around, because otherwise uh, the complexity of computations will, will grow uh, rapidly. Uh, regarding the differences and similarities of the um, modeling and parameters and also the, um, the details of the force field, um, uh, I would say that at least from, from our, but also other work, uh, it's, it seems to be clear that uh, those uh, interactions which are below 50 kb uh, with the resolution, so like 1 kb, like in our case, Chiapet, seems to be governed by a slightly different uh, physics of, you know, uh, certain proteins, bindings, and, and um, whereas the, the scale which is goes uh, uh, like over 50 kb, 100 kb megabases, that would be maybe driven mostly by the epigenomic marks and certain uh, slightly different force fields. So in our case, in our model, we actually um, optimize each scale separately. Uh, but typically the, the difference is, you know, between the chromatin loops and uh, um, like coloring of the chromatin fiber in the scale of uh, domains and chromosomes. So that I would say that, you know, the, the border, uh, for ex uh, one, one additional argument for that. So we perform a machine learning deep learning model and we train it to recognize the interactions. So, so the, the model which works very good in the scale of below 50 kb it's actually not so good uh, in the in the scale over 50 kb and vice versa i mean if you take the the model which is trained over the 50 kb uh, which is which would be one of your 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 actual papers uh, i mentioned in the talk uh, then the question still is open i mean how to predict very precisely the the chromatin loop so there is like, that's why I, I, I think it has a kind no, of... No, 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 this is very nice. I, I, 
I, I'm not criticized. I'm just wondering, in a sense, we all try to do this volume when you're allowed or not allowed to do this sort of partition. That's very convenient computation. I'm not sure that physically it's correct, but that's a very nice answer. Thank you. Well, yeah, I cannot agree more. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so the, the last question is from Peter. Um, yeah, that's very nice. Um, and uh, very ambitious to, uh, to get everything done from the big scale to the small scale. I was wondering, um, uh, when I looked at the few structures you showed, I'm, I'm afraid I, I never got a chance to study your structures in general, but in the show, pictures you showed, they looked very intricate. And I wondered whether there are knots in the structures that you uh, find. So, so the, the structures uh, could be accessed in, the, uh, in our web server, mm -hmm. but uh, I should mention that uh, this web server is somehow uh, in response to certain needs of biologists who would like to see some, you know, some uh, spatial details, but not putting too much of um, certain details, which, you know, make the picture more fuzzy. So, so for example, we, we, the biologists tend to use our average structures, and every time we, we try to, to you know, do some, some uh, specific analysis, then when we provide ensembles or we start to calculate some uh, statistical physics uh, observables, it's, uh, for them it's, uh, of course, very interesting, but you know, they, for the purposes of the uh, publications or even to discuss certain things, they, they prefer to have uh, certain simplification. So uh, please keep in mind that, you know, the certain, uh, certain things are actually with the purpose of visualization in mind. Um, and uh, it's maybe not uh, political to, to admit, but most of our users uh, of our web server are actually biologists who prefer to have uh, very clear single average structure with the distances when they can measure uh, in camera or, or some some other softwares and, and play uh, play with that. You, you, so, you're, you're probably in touch with Joanna Zolkowska. I don't know if she's she loves knots. So if you uh, if you work with her, I think you'll find some very interesting things. Uh, definitely, anyway, that's yeah. that's uh, something which we are actually currently working. Okay. Um, and I would say that uh, it's very tricky. So so. So we, we, we actually developed, uh, with the help of mathematicians uh, from the Warsaw University, our collaborators, uh, algorithm which take the set of contacts and predict if the, 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 the region is not uh, knots or, or links, uh, what's the, the topology of it. Um, and I, I would say that um, the results at the, uh, at the scale of chromatin loops are rather this discouraging in terms of density or number of nodes which are occupying uh, um, genome. And of course, we know from biology that, you know, topoisomerases are actually releasing those uh, topological stress by cutting and, and then and allowing to um, uh, equilibrate the, the, no, the, 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 the complexity. Uh, still, we were counting that uh, for the idea that actually each topologically associating domain is somehow centered on the specific set of links which, which somehow keep the, the chromatin somehow under the certain topological constraints. But it seems that it's uh, more complex than, than, than we thought. Of course, we are working on the po population averages. So, you know, this is uh, actually a tremendous question uh, and working with the single, uh, single cell um, uh, data, 3D genomic data, it's still not at the scales we would like to, to discuss. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Professor Polinski, for your talk. Um, and uh, um, everyone should say thank you to him. Um, and our, our next talk um, will be um, Megan King from Yale University. Um, and she'll be just showing us um, a nucleosome constrained model for topologically associating domains. So it's a pleasure to be remotely uh, here today to share a recent story uh, that is really uh, come from a really fun collaboration between my group and I'm in the cell biology department um, at Yale and the group of Simon Mokri, uh, who is a physicist at Yale. 
And I'm just showing up, up front here the pictures of the amazing team who have contributed to this project and really worked hard to bring together our biological data, which is predominantly my contribution to this work, with simulations that have uh, been carried out in Simon's lab. And also just before I begin, I just want to point out that the work that I'll be describing today uh, was recently deposited on the bioarchive, and so you can go back and look more at the data there um, if you're interested. And so I just want to start um, by introducing everybody to the concept of TADs, or topologically associating domains. And TADs over the past 10 years have become really foundational in our understanding of the kind of mesoscale of chromatin organization. And TADs are seen across all organisms. So, so what are TADs? TADs have really been revealed by techniques like HI-C, and I'm just showing some contact probability maps or interaction maps that come from HI-C data where you can appreciate as you look down the chromosome, there are regions of relatively high contact probability, and then there are boundaries that segregate these regions from upstream or downstream TADs, which again have higher contact probability within these topologically associating domains. And in particular today, I'm going to show you biological data coming from one of our favorite genetic models, and that's Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which is a fission yeast. But in our simulations, I'll also be talking about work where we've leveraged high c data from mouse. And that is uh, helpful to us because these topological domains are much larger than those that are seen in fission yeast. Another key player in my talk will be the SMC complexes. So SMC complexes, like TADs, are broadly conserved from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. And they all have this type of architecture that I'm showing you here of these rings. And uh, in particular, I'll be focusing on cohesin and condensin, which are two flavors of SMC complexes. And there's one form of cohesin and one form of condensin present in Schizosaccharomyces pombi. Again, that's, then that'll be the data that I will be showing you. So one thing that's very clear is that not only are SMC complexes like cohesin and condensin contributing to the topological domains that are observed in vivo, um, but also there are very interesting relationships between their occupancy in the genome and these boundary elements that are seen between topological domains, topological domains, and I'll, I'll come to that in a bit. So my lab has long been interested in what determines the dynamic properties of chromatin, and we approach measuring chromatin dynamics using the approach that I've outlined here. So we take LAC operator sequences, which are derived from bacteria, and we engineer them into fission yeast. We can then visualize these chromatin tags by expression of GFP fusions of the LAC repressor, LAC-I. And this allows us then in the microscope to be able to monitor the position of a region of the chromatin over time. And so here I'm showing you an example of a field of fission yeast. You can see that each of these is an individual cell, and there's one locus that's lighting up here per cell, and that position of that depends on where we have inserted the LAC operator into the genome. We can then take movies of the motion of these chromatin loci over time, as I'm showing you here, and we typically, for the movies I'll be showing you today, we've extracted data from the 50 millisecond timescales. So how do we go about taking this kind of dynamics of chromatin and extracting quantitative information? Um, and so we do this by following the position of these LAC operator arrays over time, as is depicted here. And one nice thing about LAC operators is that they are diffraction limited, and so they're really well described by the point spread function of the microscope. And this allows us to reconstruct the position of the LAC operator uh, with high precision. And then we can track these particles over time, and I'm just showing you an example of what a particle track would look like. And then from this particle tracking data, what we do is that we convert this into an expression of the diffusivity of the chromatin, specifically the mean squared displacement versus time. Now this is something that has been done uh, by, in many organisms over many years, and typically what we observe for chromatin dynamics across organisms is an MSD plot, uh, similar to what I'm showing you here. This is what we consider kind of a generic locus in fission yeast. Um, in this case, the operator is near the gene MMF1. So if we were to look at kind of normal diffusion, what you'd expect is a straight line in an MSD versus delta T plot. But instead, what is commonly observed for chromatin is this constrained diffusion. And so you can see that instead of being linear, that over time, the, the motion of the locus falls off. 
And this can be described by a scaling exponent. And though I don't have a lot of time to talk about this today, we have determined the scaling exponent that's appropriate for fission yeast by fitting data, such as the data that I'm showing you here, and that scaling factor is between 0.44 and 0.45. And uh, more information on, on that aspect of this work is uh, available in the preprint, but I don't have time to talk about it today. So we observe a character characteristic diffusivity on this time scale, and I just want to point out this is the second time scale um, for an individual locus like MMF1. But really interestingly, if we look now at many different loci, so here I'm showing you now five additional loci that are at different positions throughout the fission yeast genome, we see that actually the diffusivity is very similar, again, on the seconds time scale. Uh, and this might be different if we were to look at the minutes time scale where other kinds of constraints to chromatin mobility might come into play. But on this time scale, we actually see a very characteristic behavior. And again, from this kind of behavior across different regions of the genome, we're able to, uh, to describe uh, this scaling exponent. So one of the other mysteries that has long been appreciated for decades at this point is that the motion that we observe for a chromatin locus in a live cell uh, is dependent on energy, at least to some extent. And I'm just showing you an example of what this looks like in fission yeast here. So again, here is that MMF1 locus that I've already described. If we now deplete energy by the addition of sodium azide, you can see that this has a, a really profound effect on the observed chromatin mobility. And the diffusivity drops by about 50%. On uh, addition, in this plot, we just have cells that are fixed, just to convince ourselves that the motion that we observe here is true motion of the chromatin mobility. So the source of the energy that drives chromatin mobility through the use of ATP has long been a mystery. And it's one of the things that we were hoping to address in this study. So one of the things that was an obvious candidate, particularly in fission yeast, is a role for the cytoskeleton. So in fission yeast, the chromosomes are organized in the so-called rabble conformation, where the centromeres are tethered to the spindle pole body, which is the centrosome equivalent in yeasts. And then the chromosomes are kind of splayed out because the telomeres are also associated with the nuclear periphery. And then there's often the constraint of the ribosomal DNA, which is in the ends of chromosome three in fission yeast in the nucleolus, which is depicted here in red. So in fission yeast, this spindle pole body interface is actively driven by microtubule dynamics. And so microtubule forces are being exerted on the centromeres of the chromosomes. And so we were interested in whether this might be one of the contributions of energy to the chromatin mobility that we observe. So I'm here I'm, going to, I'm showing you two, uh, two different loci. So MMF1, again, our kind of favorite that I've already introduced, is shown here in red. Just notice this is a different scale, and that will become apparent in a moment. Why? Um, and so you can see that when we uh, disrupt these microtubule forces, which we do by the addition of this drug MBC, then you see that there is only a very small effect on the mo motion that we observe, particularly on these short second time scales. And so that's reflected by a very small decrease uh, in the diffusivity uh, on this time scale. Uh, what I'm showing you here in cyan is a LAC operator that is instead inserted directly into the centromere region. So we're really looking at the centromere dynamics. And here on this short time scale, what you observe is that actually this is one region of the genome where the, where the chromatin is more constrained than those six loci that I presented to you before. Uh, again, here, if we depolymerize microtubules, this has very little effect. And that's because here we're really looking at a time scale that is shorter than the time scale of the driving of the microtubule dynamics. If we now look at longer time scales, so here you'll see that I'm showing you for the tens of seconds, what you'll instead see is a really different behavior for MMF1 and the SEN2 LAC operator. So on these long time scales, you can see that there is an influence of microtubule dynamics on the diffusivity that we measure at MMF1, but that, that actually the centromeres which are actually driven have a very different profile. And this reflects the active driving of, from microtubules that we would expect to see. So this greater or super diffusivity, super diffusivity is because of the, the energy dependent driving of the centromeres by microtubules. So taken together, this argues that microtubules are not having much of an effect on the timescale that I'm focusing on today, which is the seconds timescale.
And so this does not appear to be really a, a major contributor, uh, even in fission yeast, to the behavior that we're seeing for chromatin. So what might, uh, so what might be contributing? Right, so if it's not microtubule dynamics, what other ATP dependent activities might be responsible? And so one of the things that we are really interested to explore is the potential role for loop extrusion. So let me introduce this loop extrusion factor model. Uh, much of this has been developed in the lab of Lean and Mirny. Uh, and, and, and what I'm showing you here are some simulations of this model that they have carried out. So the concept of the, of the left model is that loop extrusion factors and loop extrusion factors we can equate with the SMC complexes that I introduced at the beginning of the talk. That loop extrusion factors are randomly loaded onto the chromatin and by holding two regions of the DNA together and then extruding the DNA through, uh, through the complex, this leads to the formation of these loops. And so that's the so-called loop extrusion activity. And the idea is that there would be continued loop extrusion until these loop extruding factors reach boundary elements, which are shown here in red in this diagram. And one of the most commonly thought uh, boundary elements to be important for the formation of topological domains is, is the factor CTCF. And so that's one, one kind of biological a molecule we, we can imagine, but there are also many other factors that likely contribute to boundary elements in the genome. So once these loop extrusion factors arrive at these boundary elements, they can no longer continue to extrude, and this would lead to a more stable loop conformation um, that, that still is dynamic because these loops can still fall apart and be formed once again. So if we then look at what we predict for the position of topologically associating domains, what you can see is that the boundaries between individual domains are predicted by where these boundary elements are found. So the loading of the left is random, but then the left is stopped from extruding further by these boundary elements, which are embedded in the sequence of the DNA. So this was an attractive possibility for one of an, another uh, type of activity that could be driving the chromatin mobility that we see that is energy dependent because these lefts, cohesin and condensin, are ATPases. Um, so so this, this is the model that I've already described. And importantly, there's been a whole host of really beautiful studies demonstrating the ability of SMC complexes, cohesin and condensin, to use ATP to drive loop extrusion in an ATP-dependent manner. Um, and so this led us to ask, uh, is it cohesin or condensin activities that are actually driving the chromatin mobility that's dependent on ATP in fission yeast? And again, fission yeast is a really nice model because uh, we have alleles that are available where we can critically inactivate these SMC complexes. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you here. We took advantage of, of several alleles. Here I'm showing you a temperature sensitive allele of MIS-4, which is a loading factor for cohesin and one of the SMC components, a cut 14 of condensin. And so what was very clear when we looked at these critical loss of function by switching temperatures of these alleles and looked at their effect on dynamics is that they did not, uh, that the data did not conform to what we had predicted. So here again, our favorite locus, MMF1, you can see that if we inactivate CUT14 or MIS4, what we actually see is a boost in the chromatin mobility. So this is inconsistent with the idea that the activities of these factors are major drivers of chromatin motion. Instead, we observe more motion when we uh, inactivate these components. This is not specific to MMF1. I'm just showing you another locus, PFL5, where we observe the same type of, of, of increase in chromatin mobility when we inactivate cohesin loading or condensin. So this data really suggests that the predominant effect of SMC complexes on the chromatin mobility is constraining. And that constraint we can think about because of the looping interactions would be constraining to the chromatin mobility. Um, and that the loss of these looping interactions will lead the chromatin to become more mobile. Um, and so while this was really interesting, it also didn't help us to understand, once again, what are the factors that are actually driving this ATP-dependent chromatin mobility. And so one thing we came back to considering is the potential influence of nucleosomes, right? Keeping in mind that DNA is not naked in the cell, but in eukaryotes, it's going to be packaged by histones into nucleosomes. And uh, some very nice work from Eric Green's lab had already demonstrated that if you look at cohesin in vitro loaded onto DNA, 
that nucleosomes can have a profound effect on the dynamics of those cohesive molecules. So they can kind of uh, diffuse along the DNA in the absence of nucleosomes. But when single nucleosomes are inserted, which are shown with the asterisks in, in these plots, there's a depletion of the residence of cohesin at these positions. And indeed, on a fully chromatized substrate, the cohesin is, is highly constrained. You know, how this would work kind of depends on what we think about the structure of the ring of the SMC complex relative to the scale of the nucleosome. And I just want to point out that some recent structural biology really suggests that the ring could be uh, more collapsed maybe than was first thought, which would be consistent with the nucleosome being able to prevent the diffusion of cohesin along the DNA in this type of experiment. And indeed, work from Frank Ullman's lab over the past decades has demonstrated uh, biologically that this is likely to be important when we consider where cohesin molecules are found in vivo. This is looking at the RAD21 component of cohesin by chip data. And what Frank's lab has long observed is that the molecules of cohesin are often kind of piled up at regions of convergent gene transcription. And that has suggested that there is a constraint of the position of those cohesin molecules that is uh, that re is retained at these sites of convergent transcription because there is no further nucleosome remodeling that might allow for these molecules to move. And this has led to models such as the one articulated here by, by Frank Ullman uh, with the idea that uh, that SMC complexes are also preferentially loaded into nucleosome depleted regions which are often found at gene promoters and that these SMCs, particularly cohesin, can only move along the gene coincident with gene transcription, and then the molecules are dumped off at the site of termination, uh, again leading to uh, cohesin accumulating at a convergent genes. And the idea is that this is dependent on the long lifetime of cohesin, whereas condensin is more mobile, and so it may be less prone to this. So this led us to ask, do nucleosomes present a barrier to left translocation? And do nucleosome remodeling contribute to the chromatin dynamics that we've seen? This leads us to additional factors. Indeed, this is supported by data from Susan Gasser's lab, where they found that driving to local transcription can boost the chromatin mobility. This is now in budding yeast. And this actually depends specifically on the NO80 chromatin remodeler, but not on SOAR or RISC. And using a, an approach where they could target the NO80 complex to a locus, they were able to show that just targeting NO80 was sufficient to boost chromatin mobility independent of transcription. So we followed up on this by looking at, at nucleosome remodeling in fission yeast, and our data largely recapitulate what the Gasser lab described in budding yeast. So here again is our locus MMF1. We find if we deplete the protein ARP8, which is a non-essential component of the NO80 chromatin remodeler, this does lead to a decrease in chromatin mobility. For reference, here is ATP depletion in gray. If we deplete ARP9, which is a component of SOAR and RISC, we don't see any effect on the diffusivity. So again, NO80 is somehow special, and I would just point out this is actually a hypermorph of NO80 because NO80 is essential, and we're very interested to determine using uh, oxymediated degrons if all of this mobility is in fact due to NO80 activity. We wanted to combine this with loss of SMC complexes to, to really interrogate whether these are acting together, uh, and so far these have been our observations. So again, if we look at a loss of condensin function here, you see that the mobility is boosted. We can see that the mobility is now further constrained if we also deplete ARP8, but the mobility does not go down to below wild type levels. And so this suggests that there is a complex relationship between SMC complexes and ARP8. And this is, uh, and if we look at the permissive temperature, really, we can phenocopy what we see for an ARP8 knockout, even in the presence of cut 14, which you would expect because the protein is functional at that temperature. Okay, so, uh, so I've already introduced this concept that transcriptional units might be important for the movement of SMC complexes through nucleosome remodeling. So this led to a prediction, if the, and it led us to ask if the loading and steady state distribution of SMC complexes isn't beholden to this underlying gene architecture. So we asked, can we actually predict the folding of the chromosome, these topologically associating domains, just based on the position of genes? And so we built these simulations, and so I'll just take you through the concept of the simulation. Here we have bias loading of SMC complexes at gene promoters, which are the most common type of nucleosome depleted region. Those SMCs are constrained to the promoter, 
Um, unless there is a remodeling of the nucleosomes that are adjacent that would otherwise constrain the SMC, this would be coincident with the transcription, and so it's directional from that promoter through the gene itself, which would lead to the eviction or remodeling of nucleosomes that would allow the SMC to slide. And then rebinding or stabilization of nucleosomes in the wake of the replication, I'm sorry, of the transcription machinery would then lead to the rebinding of nucleosomes, leading to the trapping essentially of the SMC complex in a new position. And that this would go until reaching the end of the gene and termination of transcription. And then these SMCs again are dynamic and might dissociate. So we modeled this, again, using, now we, we decided to turn to the mouse genome because topological domains are larger and so there's more data off of the diagonal. Here I'm showing you experimental data in the top quadrant and in our nucleosome constrained model on the bottom left. And I'm showing you just the distribution of genes, which is the information that's been used in our simulation, but I'm also showing you the distribution of CTCF sites, which is important for other simulations that have been carried out. So using just the information about the position and the strand in which the genes reside, what I I'm, hope you can appreciate is that we can predict a number of elements that are seen in the experimental data. Here, for example, is a very strong boundary that is predicted based on our simulation and is observed in the experimental data. And you can see that in general that, that we predict a number of topological domains along this region, which are reminiscent of what's seen in, from the experiment. We compared this to, again, models that have been developed based on CTCF in the Mirny lab. So these models are instead based on the distribution of CTCF as described by ChIP-seq across this same region of the genome. And you can see this also does a very good job of predicting where topological domains will be found. So I just wanna point out these two models are using entirely orthogonal data, but actually do a reasonably equally good job of predicting the local topological domains. And in fact, because of that, we can actually combine these models together. And what you can see is compared to our nucleosome constrained model, that, that the addition of CTCF really enforces stronger boundaries. I also just wanna point out there are regions of the genome where the CTCF dependent model fails to predict a boundary as shown here with the arrow. And this makes sense because there is no CTCF in this region. But we actually predict that there is a, a relatively permissive boundary in this region when we look at our model, which is based on uh, where the genes are located. Okay, so the take home message is that uh, genome architecture alone, just the position of genes within the genome can predict TADs and boundaries. Um, these strong boundaries uh, can be predicted equally well in many cases by this model or basing a model on where CTCF is accumulated. Um, I want to point out that in, in the mouse genome, this is not as simple as the data for budding yeast where boundaries are predicted to be at convergent genes. It's actually much more complex than that. In fact, intuitively, just by looking at the gene position and density, we can't really predict uh, by eye where strong boundaries will be predicted by the simulation. And so we're still trying to understand this. Um, thus far, our, our best guess is that there are regions of high gene density next to relatively gene deserts seem to be something that is often leads to the, a strong boundary being predicted. Um, and this could be because there's a high degree of loading of SMC complexes at all of the promoters of those genes, but that a gene desert would prevent the translocation of SMCs through the adjacent region. And lastly, um, we know one thing that we think is very interesting is that because we do predict many of the same boundaries with either the nucleosome constrained model or with the CTCF model, that there's an, an interesting relationship evolutionarily between the reinforcement of these two potentially independent activities. And for us, this is also important because fission yeast don't have CTCF, and so we, we need to understand how TADs can arise in the absence of at least CTC, CTCF dependent boundaries. So I've proposed this nucleosome constrained model. Um, we've, we argued for an important role for gene organization and predicting TADs. And we can do this now for genomes where we actually don't have any high C data. Um, and just the last food for thought is that our model suggests that non-coding RNAs could actually be important for remodeling topological domains, independent of any function of the transcript itself, which is something that we're interested in pursuing. So with that, I just want to thank again this fantastic group that I've already introduced, my collaborator Simon Mokri, and funding from the NSF through the EFRI program, which has funded this work. And you can find out more about this online at the BioArchive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor King, for your talk.
Um, again, if anyone has a question, please use the raise hand function in the participants section um, to, to let me know that you have a question. Um, Professor King, where are you? I'm here. Okay, cool. <laughs> Great. Um, so the, the annoyed Mirni has the first question. Uh, hi. Uh, so, so I wonder what's, what's, what's the general take of your model as far as the relative strength, the relative importance of CTCF versus transcription? Because clearly you see some boundaries at transcription, but at the same time, CTCF certainly plays a huge role because CTCF removal leads to largely disappearing of most of the features, not all of them. So what's, what's, what, what, how would you weigh the two relative to each other? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. So for the simulations, I would say, right, it depends on which region we're talking about. So one model quantitatively might do better or worse in a given region of the genome. And for many regions, this is the, one of the ones I showed there, right, they actually really often predict very similar things, even right, using entirely different information. So just to make the point that, um, that it's, not, it's not as if they're are not both able to predict the same region, which just suggests that there is an important role because otherwise we would not be able to do as good of a job predicting obviously with where CTCF is located, right? So just, just to be clear that obviously this is playing an important role certainly in the mouse genome. With respect to experiments that have been done by depletion of CTCF versus um, cohesin, I think that, I think you do see kind of what I suggested there, which is that the strength of the boundaries likely are reinforced by CTCF because you'll get running on, and I think that's very clear from that data, where you get molecules you know, persisting through regions uh, uh, beyond the boundary. Um, I think one thing that's challenging is that we annotate the genome with respect to gene units that are dependent on RNA sequencing data, which really only shows the mature transcript. But we know, for example, polymerase can keep going and often does keep going, and that's not really reflected in the RNA-seq data. Um, so one thing I think will be important is for actually, one of the things will be important for interrogating this model is really thinking more about the act of transcription and doing better work to look at nascent transcripts and where those end as opposed to where our annotated genes end to really think about how these two things might be intersecting quantitatively. Okay, so our next question is from Jose again. I'll come back to him. Um, Shubham, are you on? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. I'm sorry. I no, okay. Okay, well, you, you can go. Whoever wants to go first. Maybe Joe Sager, you go. go first. Yeah. Well, these boundaries appear to, be, appear to be very, very robust. And this was a very nice talk, the way we present it. And it uh, looks like you come with these different prediction methods, and they give similar results. Uh, do you wanna, is that just an observation or do you wanna tell me the, the real origin of it? What determines the boundaries is basically, is that just a convenient way of doing a predictive thing or can we have some mechanistic or some physical justification why all of them give similar predictions? Yeah, so I think one of the, the things that's very interesting is, is that one thing that's very different is in the CTCF model, the loading is unbiased and the boundaries are set by CTCF position. In this model, the, the loading is not random. The loading is directed to gene promoters, and we're just using that as a proxy for nucleosome depleted regions. We could equally, and maybe even more accurately, uh, the, mo the model would be more accurate if we were actually using data that, that, uh, of nucleosome depleted regions directly. Um, and so that's a bias loading, but we don't set where the molecules will stop extruding, right? So very different kind of approaches. So I think that, I think that what it's telling us is that there may be roles for both a bias in loading and biases in where extrusion stops, and those could both be contributing. And also, right, they're not fighting each other, so they could have arisen, you know, as I, as I try to suggest, since many organisms like simple eukaryotes do not have CTCF. So there have to be other mechanisms that give rise to these boundaries. Um, so with regards to what makes a strong boundary versus a weak boundary, as I said, the simulation with the, with the parameters that I described 
does quite a good job at predicting many of these strong boundaries. But intuitively, and as a biologist, I'm not satisfied. We don't actually understand, uh, although I do think that what it means if there's bias loading is that there's a bias in the density of loading across the genome. And so this may be one important contributor. Depending on local gene density, that would be. Great. Um, Shubham? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so we do know that the kind of uh, the kind of histone and DNA modifications that are present in the actively transcribed parts of the genome are very different from those present in, let's say, the gene depleted uh, parts of the genome. So do you think that is also providing some sort of complementary information that is contributing towards the formation of TAPs? Yeah, I think that's really interesting because while we think of the modifications that are going to make a region permissive to transcription, right, we also know that, that, gene, that active genes are enriched in H3K36 methylation, which actually makes very stable nucleosomes in the wake of transcription. So transcription yeah. is interesting in that you, are, you can be making things more permissive on, on the front, but actually in the back, you're actually stabilizing nucleosomes. So there may be both of these flavors, which could be more or less stable than what you would find in a region that's not transcribed. Um, so I think that's very interesting, um, but is more sophisticated thus far with them well, on the kind of first principles of what we've been modeling. Uh, okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Great, so thank you, Professor King again. Um, and um, if in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next talk. Um, the next talk will be from uh, Sumat Brahmashari. Hello, everybody. I am Shumita Brahmachari. I'm a postdoc at Rice University at Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. And today I will tell you about uh, interchromosomal organization via lengthwise compaction of chromosomes. A little bit of introduction. Uh, so DNA is the chemical substance that contains our genetic information. But as a physical object, DNA is a very long biopolymer. Uh, to get you uh, some reference with numbers, the human chromosome 1 is about 10 centimeters long, that is uh, packed within the nucleus of diameter 10 microns. So you can see that uh, there has to be at least a thousand fold uh, compaction in the linear dimension uh, for chromosome 1 to fit into the, inside the nucleus. However, uh, volume wise, uh, the total volume occupied by all the genomic elements uh, inside the nucleus is about 10% of the nucleus volume. So this tells us that the genome can be randomly packed. There's no problem in just randomly packing all the genome inside the nucleus. However, such a random packing can cause serious physical constraints uh, during their mitotic individualization. Because these are long polymers, they can get highly entangled. And uh, as a result, this individualization or resolution of uh, individual chromosomes during mitosis can be a, can be a big problem. So it's, uh, it's not a surprise that the chromosome is not uh, folded uh, randomly inside our nuclei. Rather, there seems to be a hierarchical organization. To be more precise, the chromosomes are organized as a linear array of cis-interacting domains. And uh, so, which is what I mean by a lengthwise compacted polymer. So this is shown in schematic here. So these are these cis-interacting domains and genomic elements within these domains actually preferentially like to interact within themselves rather than elements with, the, uh, with other domains. And this uh, leads to a, a significant degree of compaction in the genome. Uh, and uh, as a result, and this also leads to a, a better uh, mitotic resolution. And this is what uh, the lengthwise compaction scheme is that you have this domain morphology uh, that compacts along the along the contour. Now, the the details of these domains, the architecture of these domains is under investigation. However, chromatin loops are thought to be one of the major players uh, of uh, of this uh, of these domain interactions. And uh, SMC complexes, or structural maintenance of chromosome complexes, which are condensins and cohesins, they are known to extrude loops uh, and stabilize these loops. So these are active uh, enzymes that can uh, hydrolyze ATP and uh, extrude these loops in a processive manner, uh, which can lead to this uh, uh, formation and stabilization of these loops and maintain this lengthwise compaction uh, of uh, chromosomes during the cell cycle. Uh, there is another very interesting aspect of uh, genome organization, which is the, uh, the sticking of the chromatin segments uh, with themselves. So heterochromatin or euchromatin, depending on whether they uh, house the inactive or active parts of the genome, 
uh, are known to have uh, some self adhesion and uh, which drives their uh, segregation into micro uh, uh, space separated droplets inside the genome in the figure here uh, you see a uh, very beautiful work where uh, heterochromatin um, forms space seg segregated globules. Uh, these uh, bright spots are heterochromatin spots uh, inside a Drosophila embryo. And there has been a recent study that proposes that uh, the loop extrusion or lengthwise compaction actually counteracts uh, this compartmental segregation uh, that comes up from uh, sticking of the polymers. Now the idea goes as, fo as follows that you have the blue and the red polymers, which are the two different types of polymers. Um, in absence of loop lengthwise compaction, what happens is uh, they like to stick to each other. They like to stay in separate compartments. However, this uh, active mechanism of uh, loop extrusion can bring the blue and the red polymers together, thus disrupting compartmental segregation. Now this kind of a mechanism, uh, one can imagine uh, occurring uh, in cis inside the chromosome for uh, disrupting uh, compartments formation, com formation of compartments inside the chromosome. But how does uh, this uh, mechanism play out when we are talking about interchromosomal compartments is not clear. And to answer that question, we would like to, uh, we uh, developed a simulation model. Uh, so this model is, uh, based on previous work uh, at our center. Um, and it's very simple. We have 10 chromosomes inside a confined volume and our chromosomes are a series of connected monomers or beads uh, where each bead roughly corresponds to, you know, it can range from uh, 10 to 100 uh, kilobase of uh, chromatin. So these are these beads, you can think of them as one domain or a couple of beads forming a, a domain. And uh, in the chromosome, you have a centromere at the middle, and the centromeres uh, represent heterochromatin that can self-adhere. Uh, they like to stick to each other. And each of these monomers or beads actually undergo stochastic Langevin dynamics um, uh, with some thermal noise. And the force fields characterizing this uh, uh, Langevin dynamics actually are derived from a Hamiltonian, which looks like this. This Hamiltonian actually con uh, contains uh, many terms. Uh, however, all these terms can be basically clubbed into three uh, basic uh, terms, uh, essentially. The first term takes into account all the polymeric constraints and the logistics of actually uh, of um, maintaining chromosome as a polymer. Uh, by that, I mean all the nearest neighbor interactions because the nearest neighbors have to stick to each other. And the next to nearest neighbor uh, interactions, which uh, has to maintain certain bond angle, uh, with them that controls the stiffness um, and so on and so forth. And then the next term is the adhesion term where uh, centromeres like to stick to each other. When they come in close proximity, they will tend to uh, stick to each other. And the third uh, term, which is a very important, is the lengthwise compaction term. And the way we implement lengthwise compaction, I will, I will go into a little bit more detail later on, but uh, in a few words, what it, this uh, potential does is this potential acts along the contour or the strength of the potential decreases along the contour. And whenever two uh, beads, which are on the same chromosome, come near each other, and these are non-neighboring beads, they have a certain uh, degree of stickiness and the degree of uh, interaction of, um, degree of interaction or the degree of stickiness will depend depend on how far they are in the genomic space. Essentially what this, uh, and, uh, what this term in the Hamiltonian does, what this force field does is it increases uh, cis interactions, increases the cis contacts in the chromosome. Okay, so once we have all these uh, ingredients in our um, boiling pot of soup, what we have in our hands essentially is we have a sticky polymer or we have 10 sticky polymers uh, that are space filling and uh, we do allow chain crossing but a bit with an energy penalty. Uh, so this mimics the in vivo scenario of topoisomerases. Um, and most important ingredient is that these polymers can actually compact in a lengthwise manner. And what do I mean by that is, um, is going to be very important. The, what is the lengthwise compaction? What, what does, how to interpret lengthwise compaction in our simulations? Um, and what we are going to do basically is we are going to keep all these other terms fixed and we're going to modulate lengthwise compaction, uh, levels of lengthwise compaction and see how the chromosomes behave and study the chromosome morphology and so on and interactions as a function of varied levels of lengthwise compaction. But before that, as I mentioned, we'd like to understand or interpret what does lengthwise compaction mean in our simulations. So this is essentially the energy as a function of uh, interaction energy as a function of the genomic distance. And you see two curves, one corresponds to a weak lengthwise compaction, one corresponds to a strong lengthwise compaction, which is the cyan curve in the red, respectively. And um, the, the generic uh, uh, form of the uh, potential is that it decreases as you go along the genomic uh, contour. 
which basically translates into the fact that if you have SMC complexes that are extruding loops, uh, smaller loops are going to be more stable than larger loops. Um, as a result, uh, the, the interaction strength is higher whenever two uh, DNA, uh, two genomic elements that are close by come in contact uh, than uh, which are farther out. And um, the weak and the strong basically translates to a lower SMC activity versus a higher SMC activity, um, essentially meaning that for weak uh, chromosome compaction, you can only form very small loops that are sparse, whereas for strong lengthwise compaction, which corresponds to higher SMC activity, you can form uh, uh, larger loops and compact uh, the chromosome to a higher degree. So these are some representative snapshots of our simulations corresponding to weak and strong lengthwise compaction. Uh, what you see here, uh, are uh, all the chromosomes in, in a transparent gray and one chromosome shown in blue. Uh, whereas in these snapshots, all the different chromosomes, the 10 different chromosomes are shown in different colors. What you see is for weak lengthwise compaction, that is lower SMC activity, the chromosomes are spread out and they, are, uh, they intermingle with each other to a higher degree. Whereas for higher uh, SMC activity, uh, you see the chromosomes form uh, compartments uh, uh, or territories uh, within uh, within the genomic space and these territories are, are mutually exclusive and this ex effect has been uh, seen experimentally as well so this is these are some nice experiments uh, um, done where you see uh, this is the wild type case where you have different chromosomes occupying different territories but as soon as you um, deplete uh, one of the SMC complexes that is condensing two, cap H2 is a subunit for condensing two, uh, the territory formation is lost and this kind of uh, effect we do see in our simulations as well. Now, um, I have not shown you any high C map before uh, the slide, so I am um, pretty certain most of you are familiar uh, with uh, what high C map represents. But in a nutshell, uh, what it means is it shows the interaction probabilities or interaction uh, um, probabilities or frequencies between genomic elements uh, in a matrix format. Uh, so these are both interchromosomal and intrachromosomal interactions. There have been shown that diagonal blocks are only intrachromosomal, where the off-diagonal are interchromosomal. And this is for weak, uh, for strong lengthwise compaction. This is for a weak lengthwise compaction. And what you find, what you see mainly, is that uh, if you have higher lengthwise compaction, the diagonal is is thicker, uh, representing more cis contacts between chromosomes and representing uh, stronger territory formation. Whereas if you decrease lengthwise compaction, this is the interesting bit, is what you see uh, that trans centromere interactions, so these dots correspond to interactions between centromeres uh, of two different chromosomes. They become more intense. And uh, note that the intercentromeric adhesion between them, uh, between these two cases is exactly the same. So the only thing that is different is the lengthwise compaction term. So this is somewhat paradoxical that uh, a potential that uh, a force field that that is con constrained within a chromosome that is an int entirely an intrachromosomal feature uh, can modulate interactions that are interchromosomal. And I'll come back to this uh, to answering this uh, this sort of paradoxical behavior. Um, but before that, let me briefly mention that we do see this behavior in experiments as well. So these are experiments done by our collaborator Claire in Benjamin Rowland's lab at uh, National Cancer Institute in Netherlands. Uh, and what she, what she finds is that um, condensing to depletion actually leads to spatial clustering of centromeres. So what you see here, uh, this DNA in blue and these dots are centromeres. Uh, now upon depletion of uh, condensing two, this is a subunit for condensing two, all the centromeres cluster. And the number of uh, clusters basically uh, roughly decreases by a factor of two. Uh, upon condensing to depletion. Now, uh, to be perfectly honest, this study is largely uh, uh, in, uh, largely motivated our, our study. So we can uh, ask the question that uh, whether we see this in our experiment, in our sim, uh, simulations or not, and the answer is of course, yes. Uh, what we do here is basically we look at every snapshot and uh, we assign clusters to centromeres and we use various uh, statistical methods to assign clusters and all of them end up with the same similar result basically. And uh, what we see here is that upon increasing lengthwise compaction, uh, the number of centromeric clusters increases. So this corresponds to the wild type where you have many clusters. However, if you deplete condensing two, uh, the lengthwise compaction decreases and number of centromeric clusters also decreases. Uh, this is a representative snapshot again showing the same. So why does it happen? What, what happens is lengthwise compaction is actually screening uh, intercentromeric uh, interactions. So these are some, uh, these are a snapshot of one chromosome 
and uh, the red is the centromere and everything else is the arms of the chromosome what you can what you can see here is that the centromere is buried deep within the the entire chromosome uh, for high lengthwise compaction whereas for the other case where the lengthwise compaction is low the chromosomes are much more spread out and mixed with other chromosomes and the centromeres are exposed to interact with other centromeres. This leads to uh, a higher form, formation of higher uh, number, uh, formation of bigger clusters. And this in principle can act inside, uh, inside a chromosome as well for uh, screening of uh, uh, genomic elements that are buried deep within one, com one compartment or the other. This kind of screening can also work uh, in, in, in CIS as well. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, basically conclude. Um, this is all I had to say. And, uh, and so I would like to acknowledge my advisor, Jose, uh, all my colleagues at RICE, uh, uh, and my collaborators, uh, Michele, Erez, uh, uh, Olga, and Ryan, uh, uh, all of, uh, and, and as well as my collaborators uh, in the uh, Netherlands, Claire and Benjamin, and uh, the funding. And of course, uh, thank you for uh, listening. And I would leave up this summary slide, which basically uh, uh, summarizes what I had to say. It's basic two points that lengthwise compaction drives territory formation, but enhancing cis chromosome uh, interactions, which is, an, uh, which is a result of higher uh, condensing two activity or higher SMC activity. And this uh, uh, lengthwise compaction can also screen trans chromosomal interactions by bearing chromatin segments uh, within cis interacting domains. And uh, that, that's it. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Ramashai, for the very nice talk. Um, if, yes, if anyone has questions, again, please raise your hand. Um, Leonid has a question again. Great. Yeah, so, so I was trying to, to wrap my head around. So ba basically what you've done, you replace loop extrusion with some effective equilibrium uh, simulations. Yes. And you basically reproduce what we've done with loop extrusion and compartmentalization in this paper that you, saw, that you showed Nubler at all. Mm -hmm. uh, what we also showed is that you cannot really fully capture the active process of extrusion by, by just lengthwise compaction, because if you just freeze the loops in place, you achieve this lengthwise compaction that you study, and it does not fully capture what loop extrusion does to compartments. Like loop extrusion has a strong effect erasing compartments than just fixed loops. So, so it sounds like you cannot really fully capture the active process by the equilibrium model. Uh, I wonder what, what's your thinking about this? So yeah, that's right that we don't uh, simulate uh, the active process. However, the, the idea that idea is under if you fix loops on, at various positions along the genome, we'll end up with different equilibrated structures. And using this potential, what we are doing is we are sampling all those different uh, potential structures that you can have when you have different, uh, when you fix loops at different sites, for example. However, this is, this in, this is one interpretation of this. This is a little more uh, agnostic in terms of exactly what is causing this. But what I'm trying to show is this kind of a phenomenological parameter uh, can in fact uh, include this effect of if you have this polymer brush-like morphology arising from uh, from uh, loop extrusion. However, not really fixing loops, but really looking at the statistics of when you have two uh, cis points coming in contact, giving it a, a loop morphology. Uh, but it's a little more general than that in terms of uh, capturing the 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 morphology of chromosomes. So this is uh, in in that sense. But when you, what you talked about is um, how loop extrusion is uh, counteracting compartmentalization. So I was not exactly clear what you meant by that, uh, what, that uh, what loop extrusion, that when you have direct loop extrusion, it uh, counteracts compartmentalization, but that effect is not really captured. Um, so I was not entirely sure why you, why, what was your uh, thought behind that? So, so well, you, you, you showed, you showed, you showed an, an image from our study as a motivation, yeah. the Nubler yeah. et al. paper, and right. so what this paper have shown is that loop extrusion, uh, when, when active, counteracts compartmentalization. So compartmentalization right. gets weaker when yeah. extrusion is more active. And there are experimental evidence in support of this. In the Whirlpool knockout, when, when loop extrusion is, is particularly active, compartments get really weak. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, we've shown that when cohesion is, uh, cohesion is removed from DNA, compartmentalization gets much stronger. And so, so the model was the active extrusion fully reproduces this. 
And I would imagine that the, so the question is, can, can your, your, your approximation of loop extrusion by just the defective uh, potential achieve the same thing? Or not? Oh, okay. Yeah, so- We've seen, it, we've seen I, that just if you fix loops, that's not gonna do what, what the active process does. You kind yes. of need an active stirring of the, of the soup with a spoon, sort of. Just right. not enough to put a spoon in the, in the soup, you need to move it. Right. I mean, so, okay, I understand your question. And the answer is yes, I think. So we don't have compartments in our chromosomes, right? And this simple model, you only have centromeres. So centromeres coming together is a form of compartmentalization, but this okay. is trans-chromosomal yeah. compartmentalization. And when you see this uh, lengthwise compaction, uh, it's actually what it does is, as I was telling you, that it screens uh, this compartment formation because you need to have these two come in spatial proximity, which is counteracted by this kind of... Uh, uh, contour-wise compaction scheme. So yes, uh, in lengthwise compaction also counteracts compartmentalization, but in our scheme, this is basically mm -hmm. intercentromeric compartments. Thank you. The last question is from Suhil Shin. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, that's fine. Um, um, hi, um, it's a very interesting work. Um, my question might be quite um, complemental um, to Rione's question. Because I might be interested in whether or not you got the you know POVS you you know you would expect from the high experiment from your simulation. So, so have you have you checked out have you, yeah have you checked out the contact frequency um, plotted as a function of the you know the linear length of the oh. genome distance. Right, right. So we, we, we can do that. And I have, I don't, I don't show it here, but I do have the curves that show. So when you, when you decrease lengthwise compaction, the long tail, uh, basically the power law decreases. Uh, so you don't have long range interaction. The long range interactions are, are decreased when you decrease this uh, lengthwise compaction term. So I, I do, I can extract that and I have. Uh, so you're talking about contact probability versus genomic distance, the P of S, yes. so-called PS of S, right? S, right? And it decreases with some power law, and that decrease is enhanced when you decrease lengthwise compaction in in this model. Okay. Does that? Okay, a very quick question. Very quick question. According to your model detail, um, I think that it's it's not self-avoiding um, polymer. Yeah. The chain of crossing is a load. Is that does that affect your simulation result? So depending on the. Yeah, energy. Pe right. Energy. So it is, it is self-avoiding. However, two chains can cross with some, so there's an energy barrier to crossing the chains. You can make it infinite and make it completely self-avoiding, but we keep it around 4KT, which allows some chain crossing. The chain crossing, mm -hmm. it's not really crossing each okay. other. Yeah. But they are self-avoiding. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so which I, I think mean, mimics I the vivo scenario. I mean, that is an important factor to, mm -hmm. you know, to make the form of the POBS as well. So. Yeah, that's the reason why I asked it, this question. Ah. Anyway, yeah, we can talk later. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Dr. Bamashai, very much for your talk. You. Um, we will now uh, move on to our next speaker, um, Daniel Lee from Princeton. Um, and he will be talking about chromatin mechanics dictate subdiffusion and coursing dynamics of embedded condensates. Um, so. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Lee, and I'm a fourth year graduate student at Princeton with Cliff Brangwin and Ned Wingreen. And today, it's my pleasure to be talking to you about uh, some work I've done recently on the effects of the, nucle uh, the viscoelastic nuclear environment, in particular the chromatin, on the subdiffusion and coarsening dynamics of nuclear condensates. And so first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of the nucleus as a whole. And so at the broadest, simplest level, uh, we have the major components of the nuclear lamina, which is sort of the structural outside of the nucleus, the chromatin, which is broken down into heterochromatin and euchromatin and takes up a very large volume fraction of the nucleus itself. And lastly, we have the nuclear bodies, including these uh, nucleoli, these nuclear speckles, uh, as well as a wide variety of other nuclear bodies, such as the PML bodies, the Ka bodies, and many of these are thought to perform crucial biological functions. Now, in general, these nuclear bodies are also thought to formed by liquid-liquid phase separation. And while we understand how liquid, uh, liquid phase separation works, and we've studied it for many decades, I don't think we per properly understand the consequences of having phase, a phase separated system in a complicated viscoelastic non-equilibrium environment that is the living cell. And so my primary question is asking how this picture, essentially how 
um, the nuclear bodies in the cell differ from the simple physics that we uh, see in synthetic systems such as this, which is available at your uh, local Home Depot for not very much money. <clears throat> And so in the Brangwen lab, we have spent a lot of effort uh, trying, to under, trying to build tools in order to understand this question of how the physics of the, of the living cell essentially uh, deviates from the liquid phase separation that we see in that lava lamp, for instance. And so this is here I'm showing one such tool that we've developed. Um, this is called the correlate system, which, is, which was developed initially by Dan Braha and colleagues. And... Um, it has the, we, in it, we express these two components, the eyelid GFP ferritin, which multimerizes into a 20-former ferritin core, we call it, and the, uh, and the IDR M-cherry SSPB. And so, this is, and so the eyelid and the SSPB are uh, optogenetic uh, partners, and so essentially when we turn on the light, they will bind tightly, and we will go from having this sort of core and IDR dissociation, uh, dissociated state to having a fully decorated core, as you see on the right. And now, <clears throat> to this SFCB, we also have attached this IDR and this uh, this M cherry, and so we will. Uh, and so this, these IDRs generate, or rather, drive phase separation. And so when I turn on the blue light, as I'm going to show in a second in this movie, we'll go we'll go from having this sort of very diffuse uh, pattern of fluorescence in the nucleus to having one that is very punctate, very sort of classically seen uh, in phase separation. And so we can show that these puncta have liquid-like properties and so on and so forth. But one thing that we can readily observe is that, um, is that these puncta don't really seem to change very much. So after those initial five or 10 seconds where we saw nucleation and the formation of these puncta, not that much has happened since, I did, since we showed that. And so we can see how generic this phenomenon is. And in general, we find that um, if I watch these cells for, uh, for, for hours and hours, here I'm doing it for about two hours with the blue light on the whole time, we actually see that the, um, the droplets don't seem to coarsen that much more. They essentially stay dispersed throughout the nucleus. And this is a little bit perplexing to me because in general for a phase separated system, we'll expect to see the formation of two continuous phases over a long period of time, like you would see here on the right. And so we can ask very, uh, very readily, why don't we see one big droplet? Why don't we see two, the formation of two continuous phases? And so in order to look at that a little more carefully, we can, look at, we can quantify this, right? We, we look at the average radius as a function of, of the droplets, as a function of time. And in general, we'll expect a power law um, such that average radius goes like t to the beta. And beta here, for a simple two-component system, we would very naively expect a, a one-third exponent. However, if we do this over, uh, over quite a few cells and then we uh, perform the appropriate normalizations and averaging, uh, we actually find that there is a beta of 0.12. And this, of course, is much less than one-third. And so given, uh, given this difference, we can ask, what is, the, what is the mechanism, what is the physical basis of that deviation? And so to understand why this happens, we need to think a little bit about, about the mechanisms by which droplets grow. So in general, droplets grow by uh, two mechanisms, right? So there is this thing called Brownian motion-driven coalescence by which uh, we have these two domains which will randomly walk and diffuse until they, they meet each other. And once they, once they touch, they'll merge and form this larger droplet to minimize their surface tension. Likewise, Oswald ripening is also driven by surface tension, but it doesn't require these discrete merger events. Essentially, a smaller droplet will be in, uh, in equilibrium with a larger local concentration of monomer than will a larger one. And so over time, there'll be this diffusive flux wherein we have movement of, of material from the smaller droplet to the larger droplet in a monotonic continuous fashion. And thus, the larger droplet will grow continuously until it consumes the smaller one and we end up in the same final state. And so in both of these mechanisms, we're driven towards the same two continuous phase, uh, same two continuous phase sort of final uh, st uh, state. And so in order to understand why they might be arrested, we need to look into which one is happening. So, so what actually happens in, in these nuclei? And in these nuclei, we can, we can observe pairs of droplets that we know will merge. And so for instance, we have these two, which uh, we can follow for mi minutes and minutes and minutes, and eventually the, they merge. But before that happens, they assume these two very stable sizes. They don't fluctuate a lot. Uh, whereas 
after they actually do merge, they form this third droplet that's much that's quite a bit larger, and that size is well explained by uh, a volume conservation law. Of course, we can do this over many merger events and see that this is generally true, and that therefore we can conclude that the growth is going to always generally be explained by merger events in this system rather than Oswald ripening. And so our mechanism that we've sort of concluded is driving the coalescence, or rather driving the coarsening in the system is Brownian motion-driven coalescence. And so, um, <clears throat> and so the, uh, the issue then is that both of these mechanisms, the Oswald ripening, the Brownian motion-driven coalescence, they both give you a one-third, a beta equals one-third scaling exponent. But we still haven't explained why we see this uh, a beta equals 0.12 scaling exponent. Um, but, but we go back and realize that, well, Brownian motion-driven coalescence, as it turns out, does actually assume Brownian motion, unsurprisingly. And this is, uh, this is quantitatively described by looking at the MSD, the mean squared displacement of these particles, and uh, noting that they will also be characterized by a power law with the exponent alpha. And so for perfect Brownian motion for normal diffusion, we will see that alpha is one. And for what we term subdiffusion, we'll see that alpha is equal to 0.3 or rather less than one in general. And so here we have two simulations wherein uh, in one we have an alpha equals one and one we have 0.3. And when I allow the all the droplets to merge, what we'll see is that the droplets on the left will, re will very quickly merge into one or two large domains, whereas the droplets on the right form uh, many smaller ones at, over time and don't coarsen very much over time in accordance with our uh, observations from the microscope. And so, uh, once again, we can quantify this by looking at the power law of the, of the growth as function of time, and we see that we can directly relate this coarsening exponent beta to the mean square displacement exponent alpha by proportionality of one-third. And this is, of course, actually borne out in uh, simple analytical scaling arguments we can make, which are in the bioarchive version of this paper, uh, which is available uh, now online, actually. And, <clears throat> and so we might ask, though, well, we can explain the, uh, the anomalously slow coarsening with anomalous diffusion, but why might we see this subdiffusion in a living system? Well, it turns out that subdiffusion is a major signature of a, of a, uh, a viscoelastic environment. And being that where in, uh, in the nucleus, our, our candidate for the thing that might be causing such a, a viscoelastic environment is, of course, the chromatin. And so we can look into how the chromatin interacts with these droplets, and uh, to do so, we'll generally label the, uh, the chromatin non-specifically while also monitoring a droplet that we can locally write by shining blue light in a very specific uh, location. And so when I turn on the blue light, we'll see uh, as highlighted in red that where the droplet forms, uh, there's a void in the chromatin. Essentially, the, the droplet must push out the chromatin and when it vanishes, when we turn off the blue light, that void will sort of swallow up. And, and so in general, we'll note that these droplets can reversibly push out or exclude chromatin and embed themselves and need to embed themselves in it when they, when they form, when they nucleate. Uh, summarized more, uh, more quantitatively, we can see that if we look at the intensity of the droplet as a, uh, radially, and we also look at the uh, chromatin density in that area, we see that where the droplet is, the chromatin is essentially excluded. And so this is true, as it turns out, for your uh, for many IDRs of choice, for many transcriptionally relevant IDRs, including uh, your FUS, VRD4, TAF15, HNRMPA, so on. And so, of course, then, given that we have a reason for subdiffusion, we can look into uh, whether it's actually happening or not. And by uh, performing single particle tracking on these condensates, we can actually see that there is uh, significant subdiffusion around, with an alpha of around 0.45 if we track these droplets over a long time. And so, of course, this, uh, this does actually explain pr uh, pretty accurately based on our uh, previous quantitative arguments and our previous observations of the coarsening that, uh, why we have slow coarsening and slow growth of these, of these droplets. It's also important to note that this, these behaviors of, in particular, the subdiffusion is actually very often known to be dependent on the size of the droplets. And so if we're looking at this, uh, and so we can leverage actually the, uh, the power of our optogenetic system and generate uh, droplets of different sizes and interrogate whether these dynamics are the same and essentially over different, uh, over sizes. Essentially, we, we can look at the, the dependence uh, of, um, 
of the mean square displacement on droplet size. And so we can, of course, do this once again. And we find that if we average over many droplets um, and look at many different, and look at many different uh, essentially sizes, we can see that the mean square displacements all behave roughly similarly and that they all have an alpha of around 0.5, which is consistent with a, a material that has a pore size far below our probe size. And so our minimum probe size is 130 nanometers. And so we can, uh, and so we can conclude that chromatin must have a pore size for, uh, below that, which is consistent with back of the envelope calculations that we've done uh, elsewhere based on electron microscopy and other data. And so this sort of highlights the power of the system in being able to describe the, uh, describe the environment of the nucleus entirely based on the, these optogenetic uh, probes. And so in summary, we've shown that these sort of embedded nuclear condensates form uh, what I'll describe as an emulsion that's stabilized by chromatin. We, dis uh, we demonstrate that the coarsening of, the, uh, of, these, of this emulsion is based upon the, nuclear, the properties of the nuclear environment. And in general, we've shown that these viscoelastic media can dictate the, the, size, uh, the size and growth dynamics of emerging con condensates. And finally, we've shown that these condensates may be used as microbiological probes of the nuclear environment. And so to close, I would like to thank my, my advisors, Ned and Cliff. I would like to thank the, uh, both of my, my groups, the, uh, both the Brangwood and Wingreen Labs, as well as my funding sources, um, and you for listening, and of course, the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk, and acknowledge also that um, this, this work, if, you, if uh, this work is available now in its in full detail on BioArchive, and <clears throat> I'm happy to take any questions. Um, online or on Twitter or elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, again, if there are any questions, please use the raise hand function. Uh, Daniel, are you here? I, uh, I'm here. Hi. Okay, great. Um, Yifeng Xi has a question. Hi, Daniel. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great talk and I also Check your papers online. It's a it's a great paper. Um, so I have like um, several questions. Like the the first question is um, like you have this. Uh, I, I guess this is more like a conceptual question. Like you have this uh, artificial um, uh, like granules uh, that you can manually control it to to coalesce into like smaller or big ones. Yes, I'm yes. I'm just wondering whether your artificial um, granules or um, like condenses would have any interference with the intrinsic uh, condensates of the, inside the cell, like the nucleolus uh, of the cell itself. Yeah, uh, yeah. so we, so in, the, in, in Cliff's lab, we've shown uh, that depending on, that you have to be very careful about how these exogenous components interact with the intrinsic, uh, as you say, membraneless organelles in the cell. So for instance, if you look at, um, the, our, our recent paper in Nature, uh, uh, Reback and, and Ju at all, like Nature 2020, they look at opto-nucleoli. Uh, uh, I think likewise, um, uh, we've looked at, at how they interact with native stress granules. And so here in this particular paper, I've specifically chosen IDRs that are not miscible with like, with, that do not localize to like nucleoli or anything or any, or any specific body. We've chosen like uh, FUS IDR, which we have pretty well characterized and know that it doesn't overlap with anything uh, that's already there, basically. So, so, so basically you're choosing something that could only strongly interact with itself. But exactly. Yeah. So these are just, um, so in the correlate, in, in the correlate system actually itself, we express the, in, uh, the IDR and not, uh, the IDR truncation, which does not have, uh, which is not the full length protein. So it lacks any specific interaction to, um, other specific things. I see. Um, like if I, my, like, uh, I want to ask a second question, like, mm -hmm. uh, I noticed you are in your simulations. Uh, like I just wonder, like you have like two cases. You have like a normal diffusion and subdiffusion. Yeah. Case. Uh, I just wonder, like, it seems like in your normal diffusion regime, even in the normal diffusion, you still sort of end up with a two condenses rather than yeah. rather than one. Uh, I wonder whether that, um, like, you know, um, like it's kind of um, it just kind of uh, you know a little sort of surprising because you know if if you have like normal diffusion, you, you should end up and you, 
in your simulation, you don't you don't have like chromatin. I assume like you you should you should end up with like a mono like a single condensate. Um, yeah. So that that entirely depends on just the amount of time you run it for. Like in uh, in general, uh, if you ran that for probably another thousand time a time steps or something, eventually those two droplets would find each other. It's just a, it's just a question of probability of merging, right? And so essentially, if they move faster, they'll they'll find each other more quickly. So um, if you run that for a little bit longer, you'll eventually hit one one droplet. And I also like wonder whether that also depends on your parameters of the simulation, like whether, you know, your, your, it definitely related to your surface tension, right? Like if, you're, if your uh, surface, surface tension is sort of um, um, too, too high or like if it's too high, then it have stronger tendency to, to merge, I, I would say. Well, yeah, so, that, so the way you would code that in is by looking at, um, is basically by assigning a merger success probability. So in this particular case, if you ever merge, if you if the droplets ever find each other, then they immediately merge. But if you have a surface tension uh, that's like uh, sufficiently low, that will take some amount of time to, for, to force them to merge, or it'll actually have some probability of failing to merge. Oh, so actually in your simulation, you don't have surface tension. Yeah, it's actually, this actually is just full, just completely successful if they actually find each other. I see. So, so yeah, okay. so if you, so totally, if you just ran it, it's very simple. So if you just ran it a little bit longer, then they would actually merge. And, right. See. And so, and so by forcing them to have a uh, progressive, like essentially the subdiffusion acts as the uh, chromatin effectively in this very simple simulation. Um, there are some more complicated ones that actually have like polymer network, uh, polymer networks and stuff, but that's sort of in the works with, um, with that uh, in the Wingreen group. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Our next question is from Guangxi. Hi, hi Daniel. Hi. Uh, uh, it's a very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. So uh, it seems that uh, the reason that uh, uh, the droplet does not uh, uh, merge all into a single phase is because this uh, diffuses very slowly. So, uh, so I'm wondering. So when you it, what it, what happened if you observe long enough? Does that like if you long if we, if you observe long enough? Does it eventually merge to a single phase, or there are uh, some other mechanism actually uh, can be in the way that the the droplet cannot uh, actually uh, collapse into a single phase? Yeah. Well, to be entirely frank with you, um, if you if you if you turn if you keep the light on for like upwards of like four to five hours, the cell just dies. That's to be frank with you, that that's what happens. Um, okay. But if you were to imagine being able to uh, do this indefinitely, like no cell division, like everything works forever, then like everything is fine and cell stays healthy forever, it would eventually, I imagine, merge into uh, one large droplet, but that would literally take many, many, many hours. Like you're talking weeks because, oh. because the scaling behavior, right? Because the scaling behavior is so drastic, right? Like it's, it's an exponent on the MSD, right? So if it's, if it's sufficiently small, then you definitely will, uh, it'll take a very, very long time. And that's because you're sort of stuck in the chromatin, right? And so if you, uh, if you imagine uh, being able to do it for a very long time, then it'll just go to one droplet, but it's really not physiologically possible, to be honest with you, in, in this particular system. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Megan King. So I'm just curious, why do you think that it seems thus far Oswald ripening is not seen? So that's a super interesting question, actually. Um, and I have, there's, there's a number of answers I can give to that. Number one is that um, the surface tension of these, of these droplets seems to be rather small. And so in the calculation for the Oswald ripening, uh, that goes in as a term on the numerator. So it's, it's like directly proportional, right? So um, essentially, uh, so observations from our lab on a nuclear, on nuclear blood protein in vitro give a surface tension on the order of 10 to the negative 6 to 10 to the negative 7 nanometers, uh, it's rather newtons per meter. And um, that's also substantiated by uh, in, vitro, in vivo studies done by um, Alexander Zadovska's lab, which I believe we'll be hearing about later. Uh, and so that's all like low surface, that's all suggesting low surface tension. Uh, and so that would uh, make the Oswald ripening quite slow. Um, likewise, there is, well, in terms of something that's newer, uh, there is quite, there's a large body of emerging work in the soft matter community uh, from Eric Dufresne's group, where they look at the mechanical uh, inhibition, they call it, of Oswald ripening by an elastic matrix. And so I, I personally would hypothesize that the same physics is happening here. Um, and again, there's work in progress um, to sort of look into that more deeply. Um, but yeah, super interesting question. And I think there's more, to, there's more there. So just on that latter point, I was just curious whether you've looked at softening the chromatin 
right? Because this is a perturbation you could do. Absolutely. Would be expected to affect the droplet size then. Yeah, um, I don't. I totally would expect that if you can soft, if you can find a way to soften the chromatin, wherein that you increase the where you where you can restore some amount of diffusion. Uh, for instance, actually, there's a body of work from. Um, uh, Yuval Garini's lab suggesting that if you knock down lam uh, like lamin AC, then you can get diffusion of the of telomeres. So if you can do something like that, and then you might be able to restore normal diffusion and therefore get fast growing droplets. So that, that's something else that can come. And that's it, also super interesting to me. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Guang, did you have another question or is your hand is still raised? Uh, no, no, so, sorry. I just... no, 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 it's totally fine. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Daniel, again. Thank you very much. Um, and so for our last talk of the session, um, we will hear from Mateo Szelinski uh, from the University of Warsaw. Um, and he'll tell us about consensus SV, consensus structural variant color for next generation sequencing for selected families from 1000 Genomes Project. Hello, uh, my name is Mateusz Hliński. Uh, I'm a member of Laboratory of Functional and Structural Economics at Center of New Technologies, University of Warsaw, uh, Poland. Uh, today, my, uh, my talk will be um, about the, the tool we, we developed, Consensus SV, Consensus uh, Structural Variant Color for Next Generation uh, Sequencing for Selected Families from Thousand Genomes Project. Uh, and maybe a little uh, a little explanation that uh, during our research we've actually uh, found some uh, tools that did, uh, uh, did allow the researcher to, um, to get the consensus to structural variants. Uh, however, we, um, uh, we didn't really think that they are flexible enough for, uh, for our research, so we really wanted to actually add that part and uh, that was the main goal for the, um, for the tool. And I really think that we've actually um, actually achieved that. So uh, we started uh, our research by um, doing some uh, SV callings. Uh, as you can see, we've used a structural variant engine uh, for five of the callings, the breakdancer, breaksex, innovator, deli, and lumpy. Uh, and the remaining, uh, the remaining ones were called independently, including genome stripe, Montana of a break, Pindel, Svetler, Tardis, and Pam. Uh, so after we did all those uh, callings, uh, we then, well, that's when we actually tried to look for um, those uh, consensus tools, uh, and then we started developing of the consensus SV. Uh, on this slide you can see uh, what we actually uh, created. Um, as you can see, there, uh, there are the, the callings, uh, which are not really uh, part of the, the, the whole software but uh, more like uh, input to that, and uh, you simply need to do it uh, independently. Uh, then, we use, uh, then we use BCF tools for the preprocessing, and it's the, pretty much the only requirements, except for the Python, of course, um, for, for the tool. Because, uh, as you know, uh, most of those tools produce, uh, produce really, uh, well, of course, they all produce VCF files. Uh, however, their structure is sometimes a little different, so we simply extracted uh, the important part for us and, um, and went ahead. And then we started looking for SVs that are close to each other, uh, mostly in terms of position length and type, because that's what really interests us. Um, there uh, and those uh, those SVs uh, are called in, te in term of the next step candidates, uh, and we simply try to establish if majority of them are um, the same in case of the position and length. Um, of course, the the whole software allows you to uh, to set the minimum threshold on how many candidates there should be. We usually use three because if uh, if a structural variant is found by uh, by three tools, then we consider it quite uh, quite high in quality. Uh, so going further. Uh, if we find uh, that the majority of those candidates, for example, I know four of uh, four of five. Um, are exactly the same, then we simply use one of them to create consensus because, uh, well, it simply makes sense in, um, in that case. However, if majority of the candidates differ in terms of the position and length, we use our pre-trained uh, neural network model to establish the consensus. 
Uh, actually, uh, this is the part that uh, I'll elaborate on a little more because, as I uh, mentioned before, we we wanted to make this tool as flexible as uh, as one um, as one might uh, imagine. Uh, so, uh, to create your own uh, model, you can use any tools uh, you want for uh, for the input. You can use even twenty or thirty of them. It's still okay. But you need to add a truth VCF file, which will simply be used uh, for calibrating uh, calibrating the model. Um, in our case, we calibrated the model on six samples from Thousand Genome uh, Project. Uh, so I would say that it's uh, pretty good. And uh, if you simply want to use the tools that we use or some kind of subset uh, of them, then you can simply uh, use our model. However, as I said, it's uh, it's only the matter of actually putting the true value. And one more parameter, so the tools knows that you want to recalibrate it, um, and uh, and it's done. After we get the list of the uh, structural variants that are well, created, uh, well, the consensus uh, structural variants, uh, the genotype of those uh, must be established. However, in our um, in our study, we had only two types of genotypes that are interesting for us, so we used the simple voting algorithm. We actually thought about um, about um, creating some more sophisticated algorithm, but it simply didn't uh, didn't really appeal to us. As well, it was um, it was pretty uh, uh, the voting algorithm was completely uh, sufficient for that. Uh, well, the final step is of course creating the the VCF file with the consensus as it is. We also add to the info field uh, the um, the names of the algorithms uh, that were used to establish this uh, this one line. I mean this one uh, structural variant, uh, and they are simply taken from the candidates that were used for um, for the consensus establishing. Uh, after creating this pipeline, we actually thought about uh, creating, uh, ex uh, expanding it further uh, in terms of the expression and functional analysis. Uh, however, we thought that it's better to create another tool which will simply um, uh, be different from uh, the consensus SV because, uh, well, someone simply might not need that and uh, it's good to keep those things uh, separate um, in terms of, on, of what they do. Uh, that's why we created a functional analyzer, uh, which uh, actually takes as an input uh, structural variants, for example, from uh, from consensus SV. Uh, we also can provide uh, well; it also can be provided with SNPs and indels. Uh, one of those, of course, needs to uh, needs to be put there because uh, if uh, if you don't put any uh, any variants, then it's hard to analyze variants. Uh, you also, you can put healthy variants, and by healthy, I mean common or or healthy on from another samples, which will be simply um, removed from uh, from the uh, from the sample in the pre-processing step. This tool for the pre-processing uses bad tools, so uh, they are also uh, the only requirement, like in the previous uh, previous tool, uh, besides uh, the Python, of course, uh, and some of the basic libraries of it. Uh, also, you can put unhorpositions positions from uh, Chiapet experiments, uh, and then the tool will also do the 2D analysis. Uh, and uh, genes annotation file is also required, uh, but the tool, of course, provides uh, by default the one for the newest reference uh, genome. Uh, so after pre-processing the files, uh, we start to look um, for the overlaps between the structural variants, SNPs, um, and indels, uh, and the areas of interest. Uh, by areas of interest, uh, we mean uh, exons, introns, and promoters. Uh, and by promoters, we simply take the, um, the areas that are uh, up to a thousand, uh, a thousand uh, base pairs uh, upstream from the um, from the gene. Um, and this is uh, the case of the 1D analysis. Uh, but in case the anchor positions are available. Uh, we um, look for the overlaps between unhors and SV SNPs uh, and indels, and then we take uh, all the areas of interest in the CCD where unhor is compromised uh, and put them on the list. Um, actually, that uh, tool is still under development, and that is uh, that, that 2D analysis will be still a, a little expanded because only because uh, the, um, the unhor is compromised it doesn't mean that uh, there are some problems we, within the CCD. So uh, I'll talk about it a little later, but uh, it still needs to be um, completed. 
Uh, the output of the, um, of the whole pipeline is the list of the ar affected areas, of course, uh, presented in the CSV file. Uh, then we do the calling to the APIs, the Ensemble API and Uniprot API. From Uniprot API, we actually extract Reactom, um, Reactom data. Uh, however, we simply found Uniprot IAP to be uh, to be uh, well easier to use for us, so we uh, so we stick to that, and uh, and it's working really good. Um, so the final output is CSV file with the genes and uh, protein um, IDs and biological uh, pathways that might be um, altered. Now a little more about the results of the study. Uh, we've actually benchmarked it against uh, the, the samples from the thousand genomes uh, project. Uh, as you can see uh, there, we uh, filtered SNPs um, by the quality and uh, DP, and as you can see, uh, the numbers went uh, down a little. Um, we also present there the number of SVs that were discovered in the whole process uh, of uh, getting the consensus by, uh, by the tool that um, we developed and the average coverage of the samples, uh, which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty basic. I also mentioned the. Uh, oops, I pretty. Uh, I also mentioned in the previous slides um, uh, that you can filter using functional analyzer. You can filter out the healthy, common, and uh, family samples, etc. So we actually um, there is a list of uh, of the um, filtering criteria that we used in our study. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we, um, we remove the common SNPs from the other samples of the uh, family because we are only uh, concentrating on the, ch the children from each of the families. We also removed, uh, removed common variants from uh, GNOMAD 3.0 database. Uh, we filtered uh, out the, um, the SNPs that had a mineral oil frequency above 1%, and we also removed the uh, common variants from DBSNP database. However, we also use a clean var for, um, for getting the pathogenic uh, variants and we simply kept them into the study because, well, if there is anything pathogenic, then we would want to uh, know that because that's the whole point of the, uh, of the analysis. In case of SVs, we use TBVAR um, and well, they had to be 70% uh, um, similar and we remove this SVs like uh, in the SNPs uh, from well, common in the other samples of the family. Uh, there I can present you some uh, statistics about the consensus SV itself. Um, we use gold set uh, provided by excellent study by uh, Jason uh, at all. And as you can see, uh, the, the results are pretty good there. Um, what the, those percentages mean, uh, we simply take, um, take the common, uh, common uh, structural variance between, uh, between the sets and divide them either by um, by gold set or by our set. Uh, and the 83% is uh, well quite a nice results. Of course, uh, we didn't take the final um, the final results uh, of them because they used um, different technologies as well. We only compared them in in Illumina data that uh, they produced. Also, in case they uh, used a tool which we didn't use in our study, we also filtered it out. And uh, as we used uh, well, we used we consider SV to be good, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, free tools needed to actually report that. Uh, we also filtered uh, out their set that, uh, well, at least free tools uh, had, to, had to report the, the variant. Uh, so as you can see, it's really good re result. We are really happy about it. Uh, well, in case of the hour set coverage, uh, the difference in numbers might be also caused by the fact that we also use some tools um, that they didn't use. Uh, but we'll still need to uh, filter that out and um, check that out. In case of uh, variants that are unique um, for, the, for the children, uh, you can see the results there. Um, they are pretty, um, pretty okay. Um, uh, and they were actually put into the, the further analysis uh, for the functional analyzer um, pipeline, as you could see there. And the, the final output, uh, actually, of the, uh, of the functional analyzer, as I mentioned earlier, is a CSV file. However, we created a simple R script to get some statistic, um, cumulative statistics. Mm, and this is an example of uh, the table it can generate. 
because uh, those are the genes and biological pathways in CCDs affected by uh, structural variants. Of course, we can also generate a table like that for uh, 1D analysis and uh, SNPs and well, all the combinations there. Uh, so, um, so that's one of the um, of the ways to analyze the the final CSV uh, CSV file. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we still need to do some research on whether to how to decide uh, if uh, if SNP is um, non synonymous uh, and also we want to connect uh, the expression of the gene um, with the actual variants. We thought about using QTLs, but we still uh, still need some time to actually polish the tool so it uses um, all the available uh, all, uh, all the possible information there. Uh, for the analysis and uh, uh, and I guess it will be uh, final and published in uh, in the upcoming uh, months. Uh, so that would be all. Thank you all for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy uh, to answer them. So thank you very much, Mateusz. Um, if there are any questions, please again raise your hand, and I will call on you to to ask. Yeah, and Mateusz is here. I'll ask a quick question, there's no hands yet. Um, are you going to integrate things like proteomics data into your analysis to look at gene expression influence with SNPs, or is it just on the DNA level and RNA level that you're looking? Uh, well, for now, I think it will be only on the uh, DNA level. However, uh, well, we maybe will develop it further um, using other data set as well. Great. Um, well, um, thank you everyone for attending the morning session. Thank you.